Uh, hello, everyone, wherever you may be, and welcome to our webinar on the Critical Minerals Assessment in Southeast Asia. My name is Nathan Martinez, and I'm a Senior Economist and Economics Team Lead within the Center for Economics and Market Development, or EMD, which is nestled under USAID's Bureau for Inclusive Growth, Partnerships, and Innovation. My center typically sponsors customized studies focused on economics and market trends across the world. We're placing a greater emphasis on analysis aimed at identifying critical areas for economic growth, with a particular focus on strategic topics like critical minerals. Minerals are considered critical when they are vital to key industries, lack worldwide abundance, and can be leveraged strategically. We're focusing this study on critical minerals because of the rising demand for clean energy and critical minerals like lithium, nickel, cobalt, and copper. We're also concerned about related impacts tied to the production and processing of critical minerals, including geopolitical and supply chain risks, as well as investment challenges and environmental impact. This specific study on critical minerals was conducted in response to requests from USAID's Association of Southeast Asian Nations mission. Our center sponsored the study and it was supported by USAID staff, some of whom are on this call, including Adeline Chamsadine, Kevin Ward, and Bayasa Rinson Georgie. However, the hefty, heavy lifting for this project was provided by the Fiscal Accountability and Sustainable Trade Project, or FAST, an EMD implementing mechanism providing analytic and related services across the world. We're excited for this webinar and the ensuing discussion. Without ado, I will hand it over to Nia Shinwari, Associate Director for DevTech Systems, the implementer of FAST. Also, if you're interested in similar project, please contact, contact us at economics at uh, Over you, Nia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for setting the stage and for the introduction. Uh, my name is Nia Shinwari, and I'll be moderating uh, today's webinar on the landscape analysis of um, critical minerals in, in Southeast Asia. Um, this report, as Nathan briefly mentioned, is produced under USAID-funded Fiscal Accountability and Sustainable Trade Project, um, which deep dives into the challenges and opportunities of um, critical minerals development in the Southeast Asia. Um, page thanks to several people um, who contributed to this report. I can't name them all, um, but um, several colleagues in the EMD, USAID, uh, RDMA office, um, as well as the ASEAN office who significantly contributed uh, to this report. We are grateful to all of them. Um, today's topic um, is not crucial, um, is not only crucial um, from an economics um, perspective, but also touches on the um, strategic, um, environmental, um, and geopolitical implications of these uh, minerals. Um, um, we um, just to basically follow up on the on the context that Nathan said. Um, these mineral resources are um, the backbone of modern technological advancements, um, the energy transition, um, and as well as um, in, for the for the national security. Um, however, their supply. Um, is basically marked by significant vulnerabilities, um, geopolitical tensions, and environmental challenges. And for instance, um, we see how uh, mineral dependencies have uh, fueled competition between um, greater powers and have impacted policies in the EU, USA, China, and, and Russia. So it's essential to analyze how um, countries in the Southeast Asia and the ASEAN can position itself um, in this competitive and, and rapidly evolving um, landscape. Um, we are going to break down this um, and, and um, talk to several challenges and opportunities that are present in, in ASEAN. Um, joining me today, we have uh, our two distinguished experts. Um, Dr. Rafael um, Hafron, senior uh, consultant at DevTech. He's a professor of um, energy law and a renowned expert in energy law, justice, and sustainability. His work focuses on um, advancing sustainable low carbon economy um, through research on critical minerals in Latin America, Asia, and Europe. He has published over 200 um, works um, influencing energy policy and decision making worldwide, particularly with organizations like EU, the UN, and as, as well as the World Bank. Um, his um, expertise also support global initiatives like um, UNES uh, Clear, uh, Cleaner um, Electricity System, um, making him as the leading voice um, in, in a sustainable energy transition. We also have 
the pleasure of having Ms. Laura Robinson, um, Senior Consultant at DevTech with us. She's also the president of Swell House Partners and since 2015, and she brings um, decades long um, experience in optimizing uh, natural and, and fi financial resources in, uh, into public value with a focus on risk management, um, business continuity, and governance um, in natural resource management. Um, she has developed resilient value chains in oil and gas and minerals implemented um, enterprise risk systems for for public finance institution mostly emphasizing on on cost recovery and compliance um, thank you both um, for being with us um, let me start laura with with you given the significance that um, we have been hearing of the critical minerals um, what are critical minerals and why are they considered such a hot topic Thank you. Thank you, Niaz, and hello to everybody wherever you are. Um, so Nathan touched on this at the beginning. Uh, there are a number of ways to define critical minerals, but they are critical to a country, um, and they're defined generally at the country level. The U.S. has a three-part indicator. Um, the first part is a net import reliance, so how much we rely on entities outside the U.S., the second is a production concentration indicator. So how, how many countries are, uh, are produ producing the minerals? And then the third is how willing are those countries to provide those minerals to the US? Um, we defined it differently um, for the purposes of this report, uh, slightly broadly. Um, so we defined it as where a mineral is of strategic value and or in limited supply and is vital to national industry, the energy transition and or the achievement of a sustainable, uh, stable, sustainable economy. So we used a broader definition of that. These minerals that we focused on for the purpose of the report include cobalt, copper, graphite, lithium, manganese and nickel, particularly because of their uh, abundance in Southeast Asia, as well as their requirement for the energy transition and the digital transformation. And those that definition is really about how important they are to an economy and how challenging these um, the supply chains can be. That if there is a disruption, it will disrupt not only an industry, but the national economy or national security. So given given this importance, particularly on the on the strategic um, value side, how does this manifest in, in the ASEAN region itself? So the ASEAN region is an interesting region in that it has not been as developed as some of the other regions in the world. So you have uh, countries who haven't historically worked uh, together in a streamlined manner, uh, who are looking at opportunities to engage in this new economy. The ASEAN region has significant manufacturing capacity uh, and does it very well, but the intra-ASEAN trade can be improved and the policies at this point are a bit disparate. And we believe as we looked at with USAID and with all of the colleagues that we spoke to, that there is significant opportunity and some streamlining of some of the basic policy structures um, and trade activity in order to make sure that the ASEAN region can improve uh, resilience of the global supply chain for critical minerals and develop their own countries significantly in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So um, we have so far covered the definition and, and why this is this is important. Rafa, let me come to you. The report also um, emphasizes that ASEAN countries um, face challenges not only in the exploration but also in sort of balancing the local development with with international um, interests. Could you discuss some of the, the key barriers um, hindering exploration and investment in the region and how um, partnership with global actors might mitigate some of these uh, challenges? Yes, uh, thank you very much and welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Some of those key barriers uh, that are hindering exploration and investment they really come down to let's say uh, the legal architecture whether there is uh, fiscal certainty uh, also some related ESG issues and maybe company behavior about whether different companies are compliant and also issues around jobs they would be some of the core uh, issues 
that can I inhibit uh, investment. There is some investment going on, but let's say there is a lot of uh, missed opportunity. But when we think of maybe how these, uh, let's say, issues can be improved upon or how uh, some partnerships with global actors might, might help, well, there are a number of different strategies and they can be around following best practice around uh, developing uh, further legal and fiscal certainty frameworks, also ensuring that there is some type of community benefit sharing schemes. And to touched on is how um, generally there could be, let's say, a sort of uh, focus on justice and equitable solutions. And uh, this was actually this was actually followed in a later UN report that was released uh, in in September that focused on resourcing the energy transition principles to guide critical energy transition minerals towards equity and justice. So I think we uh, were were aligned with that type of thinking, and I think um, there are those possibilities for improving, let's say, systematically how some of these issues um, can, let's say, benefit exploration and investment in the region. Thank you, Rafael. Um, speaking of the of the barriers, you mentioned several things, um, including the legal and, and fiscal uncertainties that we will go into details in a while. But let me follow up. Um, just considering your experience, what parallels can you draw between the ASEAN's current exploration landscape and the strategies used in regions like um, Africa or South America, basically to um, to uh, bolster um, exploration and, and attract foreign investment um, in the sector? Are there any lessons? Um, yeah, I mean, it's let's let's say firstly there are uh, struggles in many different countries around developing uh, critical minerals which is why uh, it's been a focus of the united nations as well but when we look at some of the examples of let's say successes in africa or south america i suppose what we sometimes see is that there is an effort by countries A to uh, collaborate with international institutions to assist them in, let's say, uh, developing best practice in their uh, law and policy development so that they're highlighting to investors that they are, let's say, open for investment. But that, that investment comes with, um, let's say, companies and you know local government as well ensuring that there is let's say practices of where you know that are ethical and sustainable uh within the industry so you you in essence you are building up this collective trust between the different stakeholders and you are trying to uh you know improve uh, the opportunity for investment and consequently the development of critical minerals. Thank you, thank you, Rafael. So, investment um, in 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 what part of the chain? So, the supply chain um, has um, three main streams, and 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 they have their own specific challenges. Laura, if I might um, come to you, can you briefly talk about the? The supply chain management, upstream, midstream, and 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 downstream, and what specific challenges um, in each of those um, we have seen uh, in the ASEAN region. Absolutely. Uh, if we have the graphic, if we can put that up. If we don't, that's okay. I'll just talk about it from here. But but the whole supply chain really starts with exploration. So a country needs to know that they have uh, the mineral before they can start any investment activity. So finding money for exploration can be difficult. Getting licenses for exploration can be a complicated process. Uh, and building some of that government capacity in order to uh, facilitate looking for those minerals and then identifying whether they exist in commercial and exportable quantities. So once you get to that point, you start looking at production. 
or extraction, depending on, on how you're speaking about it. But we call that the upstream, so primary production from the mine or brine sources, uh, brine in the case of lithium. And that requires a significant amount of government activity in order to make sure that it is safe. So as Raphael spoke about, there are a lot of environmental impacts of the mining industry. There is no mining activity in the world that takes place that doesn't disrupt the environment. It's a question of to what extent and how it's managed by, by the government, by the mining company, and by the community that surrounds it. So the rules in place have to be there. And in ASEAN, there are not um, streamlined or sufficient communicated or enforced rules on the environmental components. In some cases, in uh, getting the license itself, demonstrating to the government that they have the financial, technical, and environmental ca capacity and track record in order to effectively manage the extraction of the resource from the ground. So we get to that point. Now that it is extracted, it's extracted in raw form. In most cases, it is combined with a significant amount of rock, which mm -hmm. means that you need to uh, separate it. And separating it requires a significant amount of energy. So you get a huge disparity, particularly in ASEAN countries, uh, ASEAN member states, where some countries have energy subsidies, some countries do not. And there's a lot of, um, there's concentration in that because the bigger the processing facilities, usually the cheaper it is per unit. So as we're looking at that, we get a lot of Chinese investment. China has more processing capacity than any of the other countries in the region, um, mm -hmm. in most cases than any, other, than any other country in the world. And so with that, you end up having a lot of the ASEAN member states sending raw minerals uh, to China and in that case, the Chinese companies are getting the benefit of that part of the process. So one of the opportunities, as well as the challenges, is moving processing capacity from uh, concentration in China to diversification uh, within ASEAN member states so that they can receive the benefits of um, both the jobs, the processing, and the resulting material or processed material that goes into the downstream. The downstream is the manufacturing capacity. So who is buying these minerals and what are they using them for? Um, this is significantly more diversified and there's huge opportunity in ASEAN member states for them to, if processed in country, for them to maintain within the boundaries of their country this uh, incredible resource and then turn it into usable goods and user goods for the rest of the world. Um, there's also a component after manufacturing and recycling where you don't have to go back to the exploration site or you don't have to go back to production on the upstream. You're using downstream materials as feedstock for the recycling component and then producing these minerals to go back into the downstream. So you get quite a, a good cycle there. Um, and when we look at optimizing the efficiency of these supply chains, it is much easier to recycle because you're not limited by the location of the resource uh, or the location of the primary processing. And recycling facilities can be placed anywhere in the world, but the technology right now is insufficient to do this at a scale and a, a quality that is wanted. Across the entire supply chain mm -hmm. is uh, challenges. And also, there are challenges of who's doing it, who's investing in it, who wants it, and where is it located. So primary locations of where the resource is is the biggest challenge when it comes to location, which is why there's so much interest in recycling, mm -hmm. uh, and also why there's so much interest in ASEAN because of the manufacturing capacity that exists there already. Um, Raphael has a number of, of um, specific examples of some of the risks that we may want to go into before we get into the legal side. Rafael, do you want to speak to it? Sorry to put you on the spot. I was thinking particularly of the processing and the uh, the tailings from extraction and the tailings from processing that's causing environmental damage, particularly in Indonesia. Yes, so, so there are some uh, particular risks from, uh, let's say, from this activity. And essentially, what uh, is a key risk here is related to, uh, let's say, some co companies and maybe an element of non-compliance 
by these companies with uh, local environmental regulations. And it's something that has really begun to hinder some of the development because what we see is, um, let's say, a you know there there is a bigger voice coming from local communities and this uh voice is being heard and let's say it's it's an area that is uh becoming let's say a risk to let's say the construction and operation of uh, these projects and it really creates um, a level of distrust with uh, company operators and what we you know what we do see in future is that level of distrust continuing over to the exploration of other minerals so it just doesn't stop at one mineral it will mm -hmm. continue as uh, these countries try and develop other types of critical minerals so i hope that addressed that risk issue thank you thank you Rafael. so um going back to the earlier discussion that when you're talking about the barriers and, and the challenges um in the asean you mentioned um one of the key challenge was um the legal and fiscal uh, uncertainty which is obviously a key um, requirement for investment security um and and it's specifically present in in these countries um particularly in in, in indonesia and philippines from your perspective, Rafael, um, how can um, ASEAN governments implement frameworks that basically ensures um, both investment security as well as benefits to, to local communities? Yes, yeah, so I, I suppose one of the key, um, let's say, frameworks that we highlight in the report, excuse me, is that we really need for countries considering critical minerals development to think about a investor roadmap and at the core of this roadmap is to ensure that the uh let's say level of taxation is is at a let's say at a correct level where investors will be willing to enter the uh enter that country and develop different projects but that they know how that taxation is going to develop mm -hmm. over that, uh, let's say, roadmap. And I think, let's say, associated with that, you have different elements of law and regulation that need to be changed. But let's say at the core, you really need that taxation issue to be clear, and it needs to be clear as you're going from the planning phase through to the construction and then through to operation so each stakeholder whether it be the government itself the local government mm -hmm. the pro the inner you know the critical mineral company the project developer and civil society which means the local community they're clear how um let's say the taxation uh will work during the lifetime of the project and mm -hmm. in relation to that um you know the let's say the local community as it were the civil society they know what to expect during during the lifetime of the project they're clear what those local benef local benefits are and one of the things we highlight in the report is you know there needs to be clear communication around what these community benefits mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. and also uh, particularly important what is the impact of these community benefits? Because too often uh, we do see many, you know, unfortunately many examples where we can talk about the amount that has was allocated for community benefits, but we can't actually see the, the visible impact from these community benefits. And that's where we need that type mm -hmm. of uh, clear communication and sort of e even local partnerships to ensure that those community benefits are uh, mm. delivered properly. Thank you, Rafael. I, I have a brief follow-up on this. You mentioned the invest the need for investment roadmap as well as consistent um, tax policies. How have uh, mineral-rich countries like Chile, for example, or Australia managed to create um, such um, investment uh, or, or sorry, uh, 
investor roadmaps and, and consistent tax policies that basically affect investment while at the same time ensuring that the economic gains support um, the local and national growth. Could ASEAN, for example, adopt um, any of the similar models? Yeah, I, I think there's a uh, definitely a clear pathway for ASEAN countries to develop similar models. In in some contexts, maybe you know Australia has been a leader in this regard for you know for many many years. So it's sort of very uh, aspirational to get to where Australia uh, currently is. But definitely, uh, Chile points you know to a way forward and. Um, you know, Australia does give that sort of best practice guidance for medium and long, longer term direction. Mm -hmm. But if if I was to look at these, I think uh, these two countries, they offer really uh, guidance on how to ensure that, let's say, the difference, they, they have a very inclusive approach to project development. So it's very clear, you know, what are the benefits to the local community to go back to that uh, point that I made around communication, but also uh, they really highlight highlight on that investor roadmap. You know where are the jobs going to come from? Um, you know what type of jobs these will be, and sort of how how uh, they can support these jobs in terms of, let's say, developing education uh, opportunities for people. You know in these. Uh, regions where the mining, mining activity is taking place and let's say one of the clear benefits of you know going back to that investor roadmap that these these both these countries have is that you have that approach developed in a consistent way and the idea is um, no one is expecting you know ASEAN countries to be perfect at the start of this journey but what you're looking for is each every two or three years you're building in let's say new layers of certainty into that roadmap you know you're ensuring that you know uh, as one example ensuring that uh let's say local universities the education system is supporting um the different frame you know the different uh potential opportunities as as the industry matures and i think in this context um you know chile and australia offer that sort of long term medium to long term perspective of how to really I increase uh investment but also how to be inclusive and ensure that local government civil society have key roles to play Thank you, Rafael. Um, so it's not just the foreign exchange that um, the critical minerals or other minerals can bring you, but at the end, what matters is the socioeconomic impact in, in, in job creation, as, as you have pointed out. Um, Laura, the uh, report points out that while critical minerals um, present significant economic opportunity um, in terms of the potential for job creation as well as um, local development, in, in the ASEAN region, these two areas are particularly underrealized. Um, in your opinion, what practical steps can ASEAN members, um, states take to basically maximize the local job growth as well as ensure that uh, the economic benefits um, reach the local population? Well, there, there are a couple of key pieces, and I will highlight that job creation should not come from the mining industry mm -hmm. only, that this is where you get the, the resource curse, where all of the activity in the country is focused solely on the discovery of this new resource or the production and, and management of the resource, that having jobs that can go to different uh, areas. For example, when we went to the Philippines, we saw that those who are uh, working in the mine can't work when it's raining and they can't work during the entire rainy season. And so it's not a job that should be the only job. That really it's about looking at the entire economy of the region, the local community, 
the province that it's in or the state and then the entire country. Um, there are huge benefits from the central government in terms of revenues, tax revenues, royalty revenues, um, and for the, the taxing authorities. But that needs to be processed through effective public finance functions in order to go back into investment for job creation, education, activity, development of roads, um, all of the, the things that will facilitate economic growth beyond the mine. And really getting the, beyond the mine is the point of job creation. That can be in the processing components, uh, in the manufacturing, you know, using the processed materials from those minerals, but it's really about looking at the entire uh, supply chain and beyond going into what jobs have uh, skill sets in the mining industry, but can also be applied mm -hmm. to greater economic growth beyond that. And when we look at some of the best practices in the world, the best practice is the one that works in your country. And the countries in ASEAN are very different from each other and different from the rest of the world. And so as Rafael noted, it's not about taking the template of Australia or of Chile or of Canada. <laughs> it's about moving forward and consistently having a goal to create greater value for the people while managing the impacts on the environment. Uh, and there's there's huge potential in ASEAN. It's, it's an exciting region. There's a lot of interest, uh, but really aligning some of those, the clarity, the clarity of the investor roadmap. Who, how do you get a license? Uh, how do you move your money? How do you bring people in? How do you educate mm -hmm. the locals? Mm -hmm. How do you really benefit uh, so that it is aligned with what the local communities want? rather than um, misaligning because misaligning is is expensive and it also creates reputational risk for the government the communities and the companies and reducing that can really go a long way into making it an attractive uh, investment opportunity as well as create significant benefits for the the entire country all the way from the locals to the top thank you laura so it isn't jobs for the sake of job creation but the sound pfm in a mix of um, socioeconomic agenda. You mentioned um, on um, raise the environmental side, and um, I, I would like to come to Rafael. Basically, the report um, outlines um, environmental issues such as um, unsustainable practices and non compliance by certain operators um, were basically key um, in this report. What effective um, um, regulatory approaches um, could ASEAN adopt to, to enforce compliance and, and, and promote responsible mining, Rafa? Yes, yeah, so I, I think um, in the report we we refer to these non-compliant non companies as we, we give them the name of these floating ghost companies who avoid um, complying with a whole range of different uh, regulations and let's say policies in these mining areas and I think um, you know what we want to see is a a greater level of uh, corporate accountability but also um, a level of uh, you know power or a level of um, responsibility placed at let's say the the local governance level and it, that also relates to um you know different types of uh, regulators who um need to be let's say more active so we we can think of this as a you know a a challenge on multiple fronts and really what we want to be thinking is as these industries grow we really want better monitoring systems in, in place to see what the uh, the level of let's say mining activity that is taking place also the level of impact from that activity mm -hmm. and there are some mechanisms you know that we can think directly such as you know even ensuring that some of the companies maybe contribute to an some type of environmental fund, which you know in turn can um, finance uh, increased monitoring or uh, regulatory be regulatory behavior in you know in these uh, regions. Um, so there's a number of different uh, mechanisms that we can approach, but really it's it's behavior 
uh, co let's say company behavior that we really need to try and uh, address as quickly as possible because the let's say one of the unknowns here is what level of the of critical minerals is actually being extracted and we have to think that uh, some of these countries could already be losing some of you know some tax revenue which would be critical to them as it were uh, but also you know the other ASEAN countries who are planning to develop a critical minerals industry or a more a more active critical minerals industry. You know they also need to be ensure that these uh, same problems don't um, let's say happen to them. Growth companies. I'm sure it's of interest to many, and um, I wish we had the time to to dive a little bit deeper into it. But um, in the in the interest of time. Um, we have one important section of the um, of the discussion left that I would like to focus on before we wrap up um, the geopolitical tensions and and the strategic partnerships. Um, Laura, the report touches on on the mineral supply chains and how they are influenced by by the great power competition. We spoke a little bit earlier, particularly on the midstream and the role of PRC. Um, I guess my question is how can ASEAN um, navigate its position uh, amidst this competition to basically develop strategic partnerships that, that safeguard um, their interest without being drawn into any um, broader geopolitical issues? Uh, that's it, It's not possible to not be brought into the geopolitical issues. Mm -hmm. We are seeing a, an increase in demand uh, for these critical minerals from a variety of sources. So whether we see a huge increase in the energy transition, we know we're going to see a huge increase in the digital transformation. So we're looking at an increase in demand for these minerals. And when you have concentrated locations, it's what makes them critical. It also is what makes them vulnerable. So it makes these countries vulnerable to outside influences. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes the industries vulnerable to internal and external influences. And it really creates a challenge for these countries to be able to manage their own internal issues as well mm -hmm. as the geopolitical tensions that are going to be putting additional pressure on this. So the, the opportunities for these countries are to really focus on the resilience of their internal structures, mm -hmm. building policies and laws that go beyond the current administration. And um, we see it in the US, we see it in every country when you, when you do law by uh, executive order, it can be changed and that is disastrous for the industry. And we've seen this in a number of countries when uh, policies change overnight, uh, investments become riskier and they charge risk premiums that mean that you really can't do this uh, above board. And so then you're left with only uh, some of the illicit mineral trade left. And so these countries in order to really protect themselves can build in by law and mm -hmm. by, by ASEAN coordination, these best practices in terms of uh, knowing what they have, mm -hmm. where they have it, uh, having a strategic plan and an integrated regional strategic plan, looking at stabilizing the investment environment with the legal infrastructure to do that, knowing who's charging fees, how much it is, what does the fiscal regime look like, um, making it clear and consistent so that companies and um, dependencies can be created on these better practices. Um, with that, when you get this increase in pressure with an increase in demand, the country already has a plan and they may need to accelerate or adjust the plan, but it's not going to spill out into mass illicit activity in the same way that it would if those guardrails weren't put in place. And the US and other uh, countries and organizations like the UN and the EU have a huge opportunity in terms of assisting with that. There are investors around the world who have to comply with rules and regulations outside of ASEAN member states that allow for additional controls for those countries. It reduces the ghost companies. Uh, if, if ASEAN countries can really enforce and have the political will to enforce better licensing approaches to make sure that they're looking at uh, the background, the the demonstration of effective management of the environment, of effective 
payment and management of community activities, of job creation, et cetera, there's, there's a lot less that this geopolitical tension can do to disrupt the industry. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, it, the geopolitical tensions don't disrupt the global supply chains to the same extent. Now, ASEAN is very far from the US. Uh, the uh, blue water versus brown water debate comes up a lot in terms of where ASEAN is, but the more ASEAN as a region mm -hmm. can manage uh, and create a more resilient supply chain, the more resilient the global supply chains will be and we will, the entire global economy will be less uh, at risk for massive disruption and we see it coming. So it's it's in everybody's interest to start building more resilient systems. Thank you, Laura. I think um, I wanted to follow up briefly on the on the uh, on the role of um, multilateral organizations. It seems what you're saying is that no escape from um, from geopolitical um, competitions, but instead focus um, or, or look internally and and have more resilience uh, of the of the internal structures. Um, do you see any role for any multilateral organizations or regional alliances that can basically um, help um, the ASEAN um, strike this balance between leveraging its resources and, and, and ma maintaining autonomy um, in a competitive um, geopolitical landscape that is going to, to uh, get further worse? I think the biggest piece is just acknowledging the reality of things. Countries don't want to share where the resources are. Mm -hmm. They need help in identifying them. They need help in the technical component. They need help with their domestic labs, but they don't want to share all of their critical information. And assisting in uh, those components and making strategic investments in upstream, in exploration, uh, in production is important. While while acknowledging that we're not going to get full disclosure. It's just, if we push for it, that system will break and we won't get cooperation at all. So acknowledging that and acknowledging that as much as uh, ESG is a critical component that only comes with increased investment. And so sometimes the international community has a bit of a mismatch in terms of what we do. We spend a lot of effort on ESG activities and not enough interest in investment or too much interest in investment and in a, not enough ESG. So really looking at a balance on how you bring more money, more investment, more responsible activity, and then really focus on um, helping facilitate the political will to for, for government officials to be more popular, gain more uh, credit for effectively managing this than they will for being paid or being influenced to not manage this well. So really understanding the political realities of a very challenging industry. And then looking at where it's worked. You know, the Canadians and the Australians have great international arms uh, mm -hmm. in order to work on uh, this beyond compliance initiative that says you want to have compliance, but all of your companies should be striving to go beyond that, to do better. Uh, and to be able to help the governments translate that into something of value for the industry. So really linking it to the public finance initiatives uh, so that that spending, that revenue that's coming in, those foreign currencies that are coming in are being used to really benefit the country. You get this cycle of mm -hmm. political will coming from the political benefits that take place, which then allow for consistency and the legal environment which then allow for more investment. So it's it's acknowledging that there's no single point of entry for the international community or in donors, and that we all need to play a role in understanding the entire cycle and not missing those critical components because it's a it's a delicate balance with a very um, susceptible industry for uh, malfeasance. Thank you so much. Um, we have, we I think we have covered a lot. Um, we spoke about the significance of critical minerals, the challenges, um, and as well as specifically um, diving deep into the supply chain. We spoke a little bit of the um, legal framework as well as the socio-economic and and the ESG standards, and and how uh, countries in ASEAN um, needs to improve on that, and then obviously the the geopolitical competition. Um, I think we have already, um, we're already at 
1045. So maybe we can um, open it up to questions. Anyone can can raise their hands and I'll, I'll give the floor. Yes, Lauren, please. Uh, yeah, so I have a, a question and all parts of it don't need to be answered, but um, just as you see fit in the response, but um, and this may be more of curiosity. I did skim through the report, but obviously I didn't I didn't really have time to go through all of it, um, but I was interested to know whether um, to what extent um, if at all, did land conflict issues um, arise during your assessment or just your experience in general working in the region? Um, because obviously as more land is obtained for extractive industries, uh, local communities are often displaced and that can create uh, land conflict. Um, and then what implications do land rights have in the space of critical minerals? and how are indigenous people's rights to land reflected in the face of mining for critical minerals and uh, labor rights as well? Just, uh, just based on, again, not necessarily just the assessment, but overall experience, how does that all kind of tie in together, like the human rights aspect and the land rights aspect? Thank you. Rafael, do you want to answer that question? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I can I can answer that. Um, we we did uh, touch on a few of those elements in the report, but obviously, as uh, let's say, as someone who who's engaged in the research community, there are probably uh, several uh, PhDs being completed on that very subject at this at this moment. So, th so it is a very extensive area. But you know what I can tell you is that. In Indonesia, there was definitely, um, let's say, discussion around uh, indigenous communities, uh, let's say, suffering from the effects of uh, the development of critical minerals. And it, it's maybe not, uh, let's say, suffering the effects, but it's maybe more, maybe more, you know, did they have the opportunity to engage fully in the process? were they being uh you know were there let's say human rights being observed throughout the process and you know there, there are let's say big question marks uh around that and you know it it would take further study but i think uh, that's part of what we captured in our definition of some of these companies who are not compliant uh you know calling them these floating ghosts that you know, inevitably, uh, you know, some of that uh, behavior is going on. And I would say that some of the NGOs that we spoke to over there, you know, they also highlighted uh, this, you know, this problem as well. Um, and I suppose that relates to the uh, one of the other issues you raised there in terms of uh, land rights. And I suppose, you know, uh, we do highlight in the report, you know, that as the critical mineral industry grows, there are a number of issues that will, you know, that will become more important. And that's why we, we sort of recommend uh, this kind of roadmap perspective where you're acknowledging, you know, there will be there will be problems into the future. And I mean, you only have to look around the world today that all types of critical minerals come with, the development of them comes with challenges. And what we're, tr we're trying to propose in this, or what we do propose in this report is, you know, you have to be responsive and build in frameworks over time so that you can deal with uh, you know these challenges that that happen as as this industry let's say grows and grows yes, if i can add to that we we did a lot of discussion on free prior informed consent and where that sits within asean as a consistent component so we see it in 
in very to various degrees in each of the legal frameworks for the countries um, but really understanding what that is and how that can be managed so when Raphael talks about this investor roadmap it's making sure that you have those protections and that the requirements in order to facilitate or to comply with the rules are clear and consistent so that investors can do it properly rather than putting in millions just to find out that there's a new requirement so those land conflict issues are issues anywhere you have a non-movable resource and that really needs to be identified up front it's a foreseeable issue and when it's foreseen in the laws and the regulations and the policies and the investor roadmap it can be managed effectively um, even if even if it gets managed to say don't mine here uh, it's part of the process and making that part of a, the normal process, the normal business process is so much better than investors finding out too late or local communities finding out too late, which can result in disastrous impacts on both sides. Any other questions? Yes, Adeline, please. Hi, um, hi everyone, great. Um, not exactly a question, and thank you all for today's presentation. Just would you explore a bit more on what we found, what was, what was uh, discovered regarding environmental impact in ASEAN member states? Thanks. If I can start, I think Raphael probably has more to say on it, but, but from the overarching piece, we've seen um, incredibly negative environmental impacts and incredibly positive. Um, Palawan is one of the, the most interesting uh, places in the Philippines where we're looking at a, a an island that has been uh, restored from the impact of the minerals to a significant degree, as well as a very informed community that is requiring anybody who wants to do mining in that region uh, to be very active, to give all of the information up front. Uh, and they've got very, very effective control mechanisms. And so you, you see the best and the worst on the environmental management, but there is definitely room for improvement and some, some standout cases. Raphael? Yeah, so I, I think uh, one of the important things around environmental impact uh, that we that we do highlight is we do need, um, let's say, better data management around environmental issues and let's say uh, what is actually the environmental impact that is happening. Um, and let's say um, I, I would touch uh, again on some of, you know, we do acknowledge that there, there is environmental impact from mining activity, um, but more, uh, let's say, uh, legislative structures need to be introduced to ensure that that impact is limited and managed um, during the, let's say, mining project life cycle, you know, during from construction to, to operation and to, let's say, the eventual decommissioning of the site. And I think in, in its current form, I would say that uh, environmental impact from the critical minerals industry in several of the ASEAN countries is definitely a worrying situation. So it's something that we uh, do highlight as needing let's say a priority focus at the moment and i think again not to labor the point but uh when we think of those uh different types of floating ghost companies we're essentially acknowledging that you know this is a problem that needs uh a solution you know as quickly as possible and you know to go back to an earlier point i made if you are to retain a level of investor confidence and also local community participation and support you know this the environmental impact issue is a key problem and a key challenge to overcome thank you um one last question that that or, or an aspect that we didn't cover much was in terms of the government's um, uh, the, the host government or 
institutions capacity from from the deep dive into these two countries uh, what have you seen when when it comes to the local capacity and 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 um what roles can donors essentially play there laura so when it comes to the capacity developing capacity within the government institutions that issue licenses that do the original exploration that are mm -hmm. keeping the cadaster the records of where the mines are and who holds the licenses to the mining companies and the local populations capacity is essential and mm -hmm. understanding the mineral itself that exists the business around it the laws and regulations and how they all work together not everybody needs to be a mining engineer but there is a a significant environment within the mining sector that those connections among each of the disciplines needs to be understood by government and there is a huge opportunity within the international community to be able to facilitate that in particular as well as within ASEAN so making sure that the ASEAN member states all have access to um, information about how natural resource governance works um, you know the Norwegians are particularly good for 40 years they were doing this in the oil and gas side they expanded to the mining side um, but there are some countries that really look at the integrated functions within government and the requirements to understand not only your role uh, wherever you sit in government, but how that relates to the rest of it to benefit the entire country and to protect the country's resources and the, the potential that that can create. And if if I could just uh, briefly add that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mentioned uh, or we talked about the example of uh, Chile earlier. Um, one of the maybe successes there is the, act, let's say, the active role of local government. And I think um, in some context in in the ASEAN countries, we, we maybe see local government as being rather slow to um, engage with what's happening. Um, in the critical mineral industry and even maybe slow to support the development of the critical mineral industry so we need to see a more active role there and i suppose that's where some support capacity support could be directed and also to the role of different uh let's say regulatory authorities who are acting at a local level could be another area where capacity uh or expertise or training is uh, supported Thank you. Uh, Mulu? Yes, thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, the report indicates that there is a lack of transparency in the uh, critical minerals industry in the Asia uh, and lack of uh, poor, I mean, poor governance from, from corporate governance. What about the public corruption? Uh, uh, indicator how is it related to the corporate governance okay. yes yeah, so um if if we're thinking of that uh public corruption i mean we again it, you know it's let's say it's a difficult line to discuss um you know what type of corruption is going on without seeing uh you know clear evidence of of the data but that that's why i more use the word that um there's a level you know there's a slow response let's say by local governments so if if we hear from uh let's say some of the ngos or even even uh, uh different members of let's say different um government authorities that at a local level, you know, is it a slowness to response to various problems or challenges, or is there some level of corruption ongoing? You know, it's it's difficult to ascertain. Um, but you know, we we can only see um, you know that certain um, standards are not being met by companies and this is a situation which needs to improve um 
you know, there probably is a percentage of corruption uh, going on. But uh, overall, we we need to work at that local governance and that local regulatory level. And I think this is really, for me, where you need the companies, local government and communities essentially to build better trust together to move the industry, you know, to move the industry forward uh, collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Laura, um, for your invaluable um, insights. Uh, and, and thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we hope this discussion has um, shed light on um, the ASEAN region um, opportunities as well as challenges in the critical mineral sector. Obviously, um, there, there is a lot more in the report that is available on uh, development experience um, clearinghouse. I encourage everyone to read it and reach out to us if you have um, any follow-up questions. Um, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, Nias. Yes. I just have a quick question. I know we couldn't get to it just because like, uh, so my dissertation was about like land grabbing and food security in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm like very interested in, you know, extractive industries and my research focus on like multinational corporations and how mm -hmm. they, you know, take over <laughs> land.